it's sponsored by Essential Medical and Life Sciences and Think Surgical and broadcast by Informa. I'm Amanda Peterson and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. Toward the end of the webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will help uh, provide us with valuable information on how we can improve for future events. If you are experiencing any technical problems, please click the help widget found at the bottom of your screen or simply type your issue into the Q&A area and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Lastly, we're so glad to have you joining us remotely today, but did you know that we also offer opportunities to learn and connect in person at our live events? Please consider joining us June 4 through 6 in Charlotte, North Carolina for MD&M South. You can learn more about the event in our resource widget. Now on to the presentation. From innovation to commercialization, navigating the surgical robotics market. Discussing today's topic is Stuart Simpson, President and Chief Executive Officer at Think Surgical, and Errol Erchurk, Senior v VP of R&D at Essential Medical and Life Sciences. Now, on to uh, Stuart, over to you. Amanda, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to be with you today. I'm looking forward to this. So, as Amanda said, uh, my name is Stuart Simpson, I'm the CEO of Think Surgical, which is an orthopedic robotics company. Not an implant company, but an orthopedic robotics company. And that's an important point of differentiation, which will become apparent through the presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about the demand for um, orthopedic robotic surgery. I'm going to talk about some of the barriers that are um, or challenges to overcome in the adoption of robotic uh, technology in orthopedics and um, I'm going to introduce uh, a concept and product from Think Surgical that we believe addresses um, those challenges and talk about the commercialization of um, robots in this industry. So Patients are demanding robotic surgery. For the last 20 years, they've increasingly been bombarded with uh, advertising, initially from Intuitive Surgical, but now more broadly from many different um, companies that are offering robotic technology for surgical interventions. They're being offered faster recovery. They're being offered smaller incisions. They're being offered greater precision and smaller precision. And they're being offered human compassion robotic precision. So whether it's print media or digital media, these messages and adverts and patient education materials are everywhere. Over the last 10 to 15 years, increasingly the orthopedics market has started to participate. And that was led by um, a company called Mako and their advertising is quite prominent. And <clears throat> in fact, they're running a national t TV campaign at the moment called Scan Plan Mako Can. So it's everywhere and patients are just like the rest of us. They're enjoying the benefits of digitization, automation, technology and robotics in all aspects of their life. And they believe that <clears throat> embracing technology for their healthcare is an important part of getting the best treatment, of having the best shot at a good outcome. But they're not the only ones who are increasingly thinking about technology. Amongst the orthopedic physician community, robotic, demand for robotic surgery is increasing as well. Many of these physicians are seeing that to be 
a leader to have a best image and a, a, a reputation as um, a leader in the field, they need to be at the forefront of this movement. Obviously, patient demand. When a patient comes in to see their doctor or physician and asks for um, the technology or questions whether they're using advanced technology, that's creating demand. The fellowship programs where the next generation of surgeons are taught their craft are increasingly including robotics as part of the training pro program. So the next generation of surgeons are coming out already trained and preconditioned that robotics and enabling technology should be part of their surgical craft. Um, <clears throat> most physicians believe that there's a potential for this technology to improve patient outcomes. And increasingly, the surgeons are recognizing that um, using technology to replace much of the heavy manual labor that they have to do during a uh, very physically demanding orthopedic surgery is actually good for them and can prevent them from re uh, protect them from repetitive strain injury. So there's many, many reasons why surgeons are contemplating picking up the robotic surgery. We worked with the Academic Orthopaedic Consortium last year and they asked 88 members, all surgeons who perform a significant number of joint replacement surgeries, what percentage of their total knee surgeries currently use um, <clears throat> robotics? And they, most of them said very seldom or none. But when the same surgeons were asked, where do you think you'll be in three years? These were the answers. 70% of them said that they'll be using a robot for knee replacement surgery most of the time or all of the time within only three years. So physician intention to start using this technology is at an all-time high. But there are two major barriers that are preventing a faster uptake of the technology. First of all, the current robots are really big and complex, so they need to become smaller and easier to use. And secondly, the current robots um, are only available with um, one brand of implant, whichever implant is made by the company that makes the robot. And that means that the surgeon doesn't have the opportunity to choose the best implant um, if they're going to use the robot. They have to use the implant that comes with the robot. And increasingly, surgeons are recognizing that that may not necessarily be the right thing. So robots need to become smaller and easier to use, and they need to become open platform or available to support any customer choice of implant. Let's look at this concept of the size of the robot. This is a typical operating room um, setup looking from a bird's eye view. The anaesthetist always sits next to the patient's head. <clears throat> the surgeon always stands next to the joint that they're going to operate on. The physician assistant stands at the opposite side of the table. And the scrub tech who passes the instruments stands by the sterile instruments at the foot of the table. That's the way all operating rooms are set up. They have been for decades. And that's just normal OR workflow. And the whole team are trained in that. They're they know how to orchestrate um, <clears throat> efficient mo motion within that setup. Now, the current robots look like this, um, <clears throat> not, the, not the piano, the, the thing next to the piano. This is one of the <clears throat> market leading robots. It's about 900 pounds. The reason I show a picture of the piano is to give you some context. A grand piano is about 900 pounds. So, that piece of equipment needs to be um, maneuvered up very close to the knee which is being operated on. That means the surgeon needs to move out of the way. And then the second piece of equipment which you see next to the robot is the camera system. That guides the robot. And that needs to be placed at the other side of the operating room table without any interruption or any um, uh, anyone standing in the way so the robot and the camera can communicate with each other. So that means the physician's assistant has to move out of the way. So now you've got all three surgical team members squeezed in around the bottom of the bed, trying to reach around equipment in order to um, perform their surgery. 
Most physicians don't like that. They find that incredibly disruptive, and that is one of the big barriers to adoption. <clears throat> the next barrier to adoption is this concept of robots and implants being tied together. This is the market leading robot in orthopedics, and it is associated with this implant. If you use this robot, you have to use this implant, whether you like it or not, whether you are trained in its use or not, whether it's the one you prefer or not, and increasingly importantly, whether you think it's the right one for this particular patient or not. So that's a conflict where you have to make a trade-off decision as a physician. And this knee from this company is about 20 years old. There are more modern options on the market, potentially better options on the market, but if you like this robot, you have to use this implant. So therein lies one of the, the, the challenges for robotic um, orthopedic surgery today. I don't know about you, 20 years ago when I went to buy a pair of sneakers, I may just have walked in and said, I'm a size nine, give me the original pair of sneakers because there, were, there weren't many options. And <clears throat> while these other variants of this brand are all size nine, they're all quite different in their design they're all quite different in terms of their function and they're all quite different in terms of their performance characteristics. So depending on what I'm planning to do with my sneakers today, I will select the pair that is A, most comfortable um, and B, best suited to the demands that I'm going to place on it. And if I'm going to take that much time selecting the right sneaker, why wouldn't I have the same options if I'm going to select a knee replacement which hopefully is going to be in my body for 20 or 30 years and I'm going to be using it every single day of my life. So um, this concept of personalization and um, freedom to choose is very, very important to physicians. We asked um, <clears throat> that same group of 88 surgeons um, how attractive would a miniature um, version of the robot be? And they were overwhelmingly positive about the concept. And we asked them uh, if they were able to have an unrestricted freedom to choose their prefer preferred implant when they were using a robot. Would they use a robot um, the same, less or more? An overwhelming majority of them said that they would um, increase their use of a robot or significantly increase their use of a robot. So I think that really points to the um, critical nature of these two issues and solving them will advance orthopedic robotics. This is our um, <clears throat> handheld miniature robot and I'm going to show you a quick video because it's hard to imagine how something seven pounds handheld can possibly um, do everything that a big 900 pound piece of complex equipment can do. So hopefully the video is just about to start playing now. Here we go. So here's the robot. Um, the, the patient has had a CT scan, so the physician has been able to create a three-dimensional um, surgical plan. The camera system is located overhead, so it's not in the way. And as you can see, this robot now knows exactly where it has to place a pin on the bone to achieve a precise surgery. Even if the patient's leg moves, the robot will track exactly with the point and the bone that it is supposed to target. It's quite amazing. It's um, incredibly complex technology, um, but it creates this very, very simple user experience. And the simplicity of this product under um, masks the incredible innovation that is uh, inside it took about 10 years and $300 million to develop this product to give you an idea of the complexity that is inside and hidden from the user. This miniature T-Mini robot of ours was approved last year with four different brands of implants on it. 
And this year, we're working towards adding another six brands of implants. We're currently in the regulatory um, process for those brands. We have publicly disclosed four of the companies, and we have not yet disclosed the other two. But they are major companies in this market, and we're very excited to announce their inclusion in the near future. Those 10 companies represent every potential design philosophy for a knee replacement. There are three major design philosophies that surgeons choose from, and this covers all of them and has options within each design philosophy. So it really is giving the physician the choice of the right implant for them or the right implant for each individual patient. Unlike the big orthopedic companies um, who are just trying to sell more implants, we are not um, governed by that mission to sell more implants. All we want to do is make our robot accessible to as many people as possible. And we can build a successful business um, in doing that. <clears throat> the large orthopedic companies have got massive sales and marketing expenses because they typically are in have a representative in the operating room every time their implants are used. Because we're not an implant company, we don't have that massive cost. So we can build a successful company focusing on just the, the robot itself. We get some revenue from selling robots. We get some revenue from the service contracts. And we get some revenue from the disposables every time the robot is used. But <clears throat> because our um, commercial model doesn't reply, uh, rely on us having a massive sales force to support the surgeon every time they use uh, the implant, we can be much more lean and develop uh, and deliver a successful business without the implant. And not being tied to the implant allows us to be much more customer centric in terms of our open business model and our technology being smaller and easier to use is more appealing to the mass market, the, the, the wide majority of surgeons rather than just the innovators and early adopters who've used the larger, more complex devices. So that's us. We are Think Surgical, a robotics company, <clears throat> not an implant company. We've in, unlocked the implants from the robot to give the customer more choice. And we've miniaturized the robot for total knee replacement to make it much easier to use. I'll hand it back to you, Amanda. Thank you for the opportunity today. Okay, do uh, we have our other presenter ready, Errol? Yes, hi, thank you. I'm Errol Ertürk. I'm the Vice President of R&D at Essential Medical Life Sciences. It's a pleasure to be here with Stuart. His innovation and video, so energizing. At Essential Medical Life Sciences, we tackle your complex challenges, delivering high quality designs, developing and manufacturing instruments, devices, consumables, as well as accompanying automation solutions at scale. I'm noticing that I'm wearing the same shirt in my picture here. I do have more than one shirt. It's just a coincidence. I'm going to talk about the development journey and highlight what I see as critical success factors. I'll touch on the impact of miniaturization along with integrating optics and smaller form factors. I'll walk you through a use case that'll highlight some of the important success factors. I'll then wrap up with further notes on the journey to commercialization. Constraints in the operating room make product development and commercialization very challenging. Finding space amongst all the equipment and people in the OR, creating devices and products that are easy to use, such as the portable robotics instrument that device that Stuart presented are difficult. Logistics of managing parts consumables in a sterile environment, tracking where everything is tracked and the clock is always ticking is very difficult. Doctors want better tools, protocols and solutions while they're operating. Their vision though typically makes use of what they're familiar with. And those embodiments are generally unlikely 
to become a manufacturable end product for a new innovation. Therefore, a development journey is required. And a development journey should be leveraging proven processes. The process we use is basically about managing project technical debt. The more technical debt you carry into later phases of the project, the more the risk. And the more the risk, the less the project is predictable. Managing debt starts with proper feasibility phases to demonstrate actual the actual innovation, which is at the heart of the value proposition. The next step after that would be to create prototypes. You might hear them as alphas and beta phases. Uh, they're basically there to define the complete solution and implement the complete solution. The complete solution is more than the value proposition. It has the usability elements. It takes in consideration other factors, which I'll discuss later. From there, the final phase can be for creating the recipe for verifying the design as well as validating the manufacturing process. These would be where the design intent is documented and the manufacturing instructions, the procurement, the part quality, and the work instructions are all put in place. An experienced partner can reduce your time to market, your risk and your costs by helping you move ideas from the product development journey to a commercial solution Constraints in the operating room make for challenging product development and commercialization journeys. Finding space amongst all the equipment and people in the operating room, creating something that's easy to use and adoptable by the doctors, managing the logistics of parts and consumables in a sterile environment where the clock is ticking are challenges that need to be addressed. Doctors are looking for better tools, protocols, and solutions for their operating room. Their vision generally makes use of what they're familiar with. And such solutions are typically not what ends up in a manufacturable end product. Hence, there's a need for a product development journey for innovation. The product development journey should also be leveraging proven processes. And the process we use is basically about managing project technical debt through the phases of development. The more debt one carries into latter phases of the project, the more the risk. With more risk comes less project predictability. Managing debt starts with proper feasibility phases to demonstrate the actual innovation, the heart of the value proposition. Then the next prototypes, alpha and beta phases, are there to define the complete solution, which should be tested against established specifications. The final phase would consist of creating a controlled recipe for verification of design and the validation of the manufacturing process through documented procurement, part quality, and work instructions. Working with an experienced partner can help reduce time to market, risks, and costs by moving the ideas through the product development journey effectively and efficiently. High precision systems with optics and sensors packaged in small volumes create design challenges that can lengthen development. Stuart mentioned it took years for them to develop the portable surgical robotic system. This is no surprise because you all can see how complicated that instrument and device was. Challenges in shrinking designs have similar issues. Shrinking designs can exacerbate other problems that normally wouldn't be there. For example, managing the heat when you're packaging motors, lighting, and lasers into a smaller footprint can become a problem that needs to be addressed. Delivering clear images with lesser capable components may be difficult, requiring tricks. Expensive, big CMOS cameras can produce great images, but they're going to be bulky and too expensive for the solutions oftentimes. Also, creating consumables, I've already mentioned this, clearing consumables and devices that fit with the operating room and managing the logistics and the supply chain and sterilization, ease of use, all require lots of planning and careful consideration. I listed here some strategies from my perspective of what's important in managing risk to commercialization. At the top, I would say managing scope creep is a critical factor. Knowing the minimum value product and the proposition from the feasibility phase will be key for managing and mitigating scope creep. Especially with startups, their dreams are big and people want to implement lots of features. 
For that, a roadmap to capture what's nice to have in the future, iterations will be helpful to keep the focus on the minimal viable product. Also, I've talked about iterative approaches to the design, prototype, and fix phase. This will help solve issues earlier and lessen technical debt load of the project as the project progresses closer to commercialization. Error handling can take as long or longer than the happy path. So you need to plan for it. Knowing also what documentation is needed for the quality management system upfront and planning them in at the right phases during the journey is also critical. Documents like specifications and trace matrices, risk analysis, development plans, verification protocols, part quality information, the work instructions are all examples of documents that need to be planned. Let's look at the case study that I put in our presentation here. I know I've packed a lot onto this page, but let's start with the problem statement. IVF over the years has become a more repeatable and success process and success rates have increased from 50-60% to around 90%. Our client, however, wanted to drive it to 99%. The current protocols have way too many steps and sources of variability for accurately delivering an embryo near the fundus. It uses a basic catheter and ultrasound. The location position at best is about five millimeters. And the placement tools for the embryo are not very well con controlled. So the doctors in this case envisioned, a, from what they know, a linear catheter, linear averting catheter to basically a balloon catheter to implant the embryo with the aid of optical coherence tomography. OCT is a commonly used tool for ophthalmic imaging and sometimes cardiovascular imaging. But the combination of the OCT and the balloon catheter really was not practical. It didn't work any better than the current processes. So we began the feasibility iterations with our client looking for the minimum viable product requirements. And those were that we had to see and manage the embryo through the cervix to get to the fundus. We then had to sense the edge of the endometrium to within a very small amount. We had to deposit the embryo at a known depth in a consistent manner. After a number of iterations that we tested, we demonstrated feasibility prior to moving on to the development of the full solution for use in the OR and the clinical trials. We developed an integrated telescoping catheter needle mechanism with a sensor and a tiny camera which were all driven by a precision controller guiding the doctor to place the embryo at the required accuracies. I've included a picture of the patent here as proof because I'm not able to display the solution in detail due to confidentiality. Here are some pictures that might help you get a feel for our journey. The picture on the left is basically from inside the catheter's business end. The circle seen in the middle is taken from the micro camera inside the catheter. It's about two millimeters in diameter, and the sort of triangular piece above it is the tip of the needle that's about 0.5 millimeters in diameter. Along the way in development, we had to model the embryos. We created lots of proxies for placing embryos, we used humemic gels, like a lot of people do, and went through various animal placentas because we didn't have the final solution and, and we can't use them on people. In the end, we cut down the accuracy of placement from 5 millimeters to 0 0.5 millimeters in both XY dimensions as well as the Z dimensions. That's an order of magnitude improvement in each dimension. Let me circle back now and talk about the development pathway and restate some of the some of the key points based on the case study. We have a validated systematic pathway to ensure successful commercialization. That's applicable to ro robotic systems and smart sensors. Earlier, I introduced the concept of project debt, which aids in the predictability. The development is all about mitigating risks as early as possible. Minimizing project debt prior to moving to the next phase is the best way I know 
to achieve predictable and effective time to market. I recommended breaking the phases into three groups. First, validating the value proposition via breadboards and prototypes in the feasibility stage to get to a minimal viable product definition. That not only helps with the basic requirements for the value proposition, but it will also mitigate against scope creep conversations down the road. Second, iterating the design through breadboards to, to reach full functionality, which would include usability at appropriate speeds of the system, error handling, fleshing out the design for manufacturability, the supply chain issues, the processes to manufacture, the devices and instruments, as well as the consumables and the ancillary supplies during this phase. Then moving on to verification of design and validation of manufacturing under controlled conditions, which are required, as we all know, for the FDA to create proper design transfer documentation and running production, which all hopefully yields to having successful clinical trials. Essential Medical and Life Sciences delivers end-to-end -end solutions for life science instruments, medical devices, consumables, as well as the automation required for scaling. We'll partner with you at any phase of your life cycle, from early feasibility through development, design transfer into commercialization, as well as aftermarket support, mitigating development risks and managing project debt along the way. We have deep experiences in development of complex, high-precision, electromechanical, fluidic systems with optical and imaging elements. We commercialize and scale up with appropriate QMS compliance processes as stated here. Our experienced team members know how to anticipate and manage life cycle risks. Our teams are over 2,300 experts at 40 locations across the globe. They've tackled complex challenges, delivering high quality designs through development, testing, and manufacture, implementing automation of consumables for over 70 years. We'll be with you every step of the way from early R&D through commercialization and scaling into manufacturing. With the global supply chain footprint and automation capabilities, we deliver your solutions to market on time, on budget, and at scale. Our regulatory experience and processes will keep you in full compliance, ensuring a predictable, systematic journey to design transfer. Thank you, and I'll now turn it back to our moderator. Before we begin with today's Q&A, please direct your attention to our webinar survey available next to the presentation window. If you close the survey, uh, you can simply reopen the widget by clicking the icon along the bottom of your screen. Thank you in advance for filling out this uh, feedback form. Again, uh, your participation uh, does allow us to better serve you for future events. And now on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder to participate in the Q&A, just type your question into the, uh, here we go, <laughs> apologies. Um, just type your question into the uh, text box located next to the presentation window or click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If we are not able to answer all of the submitted questions during today's webinar, we will be sure to share them with our speakers who can reply offline. Okay, um, our first question is uh, from John, and I believe this is a, a question for Stuart. Uh, what do you see as part of the challenge for serviceability for surgical robots without large scale or whole unit replacement? Hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah, the, these are very complex pieces of um, equipment <clears throat> when they're first um, installed in a hospital or surgery centre. There's an engineer or field service technician who receives the product, um, unboxes it and sets it up in the, the hospital. There's then a series of calibration steps that are um, completed um, before the 
certification from the biomedical engineering is um, received to say that the equipment is fit for um, use in the facility. So <clears throat> um, complex equipment like that needs to be maintained and that's why these uh, devices um, are sold with service contracts and they have a preventative maintenance schedule where the same field engineers will come out and perform preventative maintenance on them. And <clears throat> in the event that there is something um, the unexpected that occurs, then there'll be a break fix um, service provided in the customer facility to the best of the company's ability. But every now and again, a uh, device will have to be returned to the factory for um, repair or recalibration or something like that. And when you have a £900 piece of equipment, um, that's a rather um, challenging process taking the uh, getting the equipment boxed up and shipped back to the the um, <clears throat> the factory with a something went wrong Does please try again with a device like ours um, <clears throat> uh, there's a very simple um, shipping case the product goes into the shipping case and it's picked up by FedEx or some other third party logistics provider so um, <clears throat> I think Size is is one of the challenges. Complexity um, is another challenge, and hopefully, um, as the technology continues to m miniaturize over time, the serviceability of these devices will become less challenging and more akin to the, the service that you expect for your your phone or your um, other pieces of electronic equipment. Thank you, Stuart. Our next question, uh, as the complexity of robots, robotic systems increases and consequently the reliability gets impacted, how are the two of you, um, meaning think surgical and essential, uh, creating a reliability program to deal with this to produce a reliable product upon release? Um, and they mentioned that Errol spoke about FME A, a uh, but is reliability testing practical without appearing as scope creep? Uh, is reliability testing part of your rollout and um, version development? So, Errol, do you want to take that first and then maybe Stuart uh, can add his thoughts if he has any? Sure, yeah. I, I, the way we address reliability is uh, start with a system view and, and perform a functional decomp decomposition of all the different elements. From there, we can decide uh, which modules and subsystems can be uh, have the higher risks, uh, perhaps more change, more moving parts, uh, such that they can be broken out into subsystem testing. Um, so early on, if, if there's enough funding, we would set up uh, some subsystem testing uh, to be able to address early area risk areas it's not practical typically to for complex system to, to address all of it but that that would be the starting point and yes there is a there are programs there's IEC standards for reliability growth uh, that you can that you can look up um, they're Weibull typically Weibull distribution uh, uh, statistics very simple setups that you can set up with as machines and complete units become available uh, by simulating the workflow in a simpler way with proxy materials and, and such, you can simulate and run complete systems. But we usually try to address a lot of the early reliability risk areas with subsystems testing. Yeah, and I would build off of what Aero said with a couple of, um, couple of comments. First, when you're developing a medical technology product, there is a well-prescribed set of um, <clears throat> procedures that you need to follow, um, or at least a pathway to market. Different companies have their own internal policies and procedures to comply with that pathway to market, but the pathway to market is pretty standard. And 
part of that um, is achieving clearance with the FDA and to get a product cleared by the FDA, one of the um, very big deliverables um, late in the um, development cycle is the usability testing. And um, just like um, all of the validation and verification testing that you do for a product, uh, including this um, user exp- or usability testing, you can have two mindsets going into the, the testing um, phase. And I have seen many companies <clears throat> approach that with a mindset, which is what do we need to do to pass this test? which allows us to put the right information in front of the FDA and ultimately get our product cleared for marketing um, or cleared for, uh, yeah, for, for sales and marketing. Um, another mindset would be, how do we go through this um, testing, uh, validation and usability um, work with a mindset which is, let's try and understand exactly how our product performs, Um, whether there's good things or bad things that we find out in in that work, that that knowledge is going to be valuable to us in order to bring the best possible product in terms of customer experience and the best possible product in terms of reliability to the market when we eventually do get clearance. And um, I would advocate for that second mindset Um, because I've seen too many products and technologies rushed to market with um, with, uh, less than expected um, performance criteria that have subsequently have to be um, subject to a version 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 revision. So that's that's my, my first comment. The second comment is even if you do that, um, with complex technology like this, no matter how robust and disciplined your development um, process has been, there will always be things that you learn about your product when it goes into commercialize, um, commercialization that you don't know and oftentimes couldn't know until you get into com- the commercial phase. So I would encourage companies um, we do it at Think, and I've done it in my, my past life, to have a limited market release um, <clears throat> and not just say you have a limited market release, but have a limited market release where you limit the number of systems that are available in the market and you invest time, energy and money in observational research with the early users to understand the true performance characteristics of the um, <clears throat> product and the true user experience of the product. And from those ob- observations, plan out your user experience improvement um, enhancements that you're going to bring to market, hopefully as quickly as possible. So hopefully that adds on top of what Errol says uh, in terms of how you get something through the development pathway, your attitude towards the testing that you're doing, and your attitude towards the early commercial release of a product, because there will always be things that you did not know. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, I believe this next one is also for you. Uh, What synergies need to exist between cross-functional teams within an organization for a robotic system to have commercial success? Well, uh, that's a big question. You know, I think about the, we've talked a lot about the development phase and, you know, it really does take a multi-functional team to um, describe a concept take the concept and turn it into a a set of design criteria to go through the prototypes and then to define an MVP, minimally viable product, um, that goes into the um, development cycle. During that time, you're often working with the R&D teams, obviously, the product and marketing teams who are defining the the user needs for the product, 
you're working with your regulatory, your quality teams. And we actually worked with an outside development partner called Sagenti Innovation on T-Mini. And um, I can strongly advise, especially for small to mid-sized companies, that you, you consider working with a, um, a development partner. Um, we, we probably couldn't have done this without them. So that's in the development phase. But then when you come into the commercial phase, obviously your sales team are out there promoting your product. In order to get a product sold, a complex piece of medical equipment like a robot, um, it's not just getting the physician to say they want to use it. Clinical advocacy is the starting point. But after that, you have to negotiate with the C-suite, the CEO, CFO of the facility. Then you end up um, working with um, the legal departments, exchanging contracts. And one of the big items in the contracting phase now is always about cybersecurity, data ownership, data management, data protection. So um, we're working with our legal team, our IT team. And then once you get through the contract phase, as I said earlier, um, the product doesn't just show up and um, uh, you open the box and it works. There is a field service team that need to install it and certify it. There's a clinical launch team that have to teach the um, clinical staff, including the physicians and OR staff and others, um, how to use the product uh, effectively. And after <clears throat> um, they start using the product, we have to pay attention to the post-market um, experience that the customer has and any uh, customer experience reports need to be investigated. So again, our post-market team, our compliance team, our regulatory team are coming back into um, play. So um, <laughs> it really takes almost every department in the business to um, develop and then launch a piece of technology such as a surgical robot. Yeah, maybe I can add, I completely agree with Stuart. One thing that I think people misunderstand when they hear the word development, uh, the concept of a core team uh, early in development has to, should include, you know, not just marketing and operations, but but service engineers, um, you know, technical manuals are very important. There's lots of pieces to development and the core teams that are formed to do the development, don't. Ju it's not just engineering. I just wanted to make sure I... Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very important point, Errol, um, <clears throat> because one of the things that um, invariably can get lost um, uh, in the development phase, if you don't do what you just said, is that the product may be an um, incredible achievement in terms of design, but if it's not designed for manufacturability, then it's going to be hard to make. It's going to be hard to make reliably. It's going to be hard to make at a high um um, quality and at an appropriate cost point. And then if it's not designed for serviceability, then when it's in the field, you'll realize that many of the service requirements are actually complex, challenging, slash impossible at times. And um, there's, a, there's a cost to that. So uh, if, if I've learned anything through the last um, uh, several years, it's been the uh, um, assigning more priority and focus to DFM and DFS during the development phase is, is critically important. Thank you both. And uh, what do you think about one-time devices such as endoscop endoscopic devices? Um, Errol, did you want to maybe try that one? Um, sure. Um, so there's uh, value to them because uh, because of the cleaning requirements. I don't know if people remember, but I think uh, there was a couple of cases of FDA uh, re uh, FDA um, I don't know what they call them, but uh, major CAPA issues uh, uh, with uh, some cleaning procedures that people were using. So there are benefits to to disposables, but uh, you know the cost of uh, those devices have to be balanced against um, the use case. Um, but yeah, it all depends on the business case of what, uh, what the therapy or the diagnostic is able to bear from a cost perspective, the, the volumes of it, and also um, 
So in the case of this IVF uh, case, we have actually in there uh, some consumables that are thrown out, uh, which are uh, cheap and inexpensive, but there are others that are used multiple times uh, because they cost more. So there's always a balance between um, those components. Yes, uh, indeed, there was uh, quite the uh, quite a slew of recalls um, uh, several years ago, and FDA has been paying a lot of attention to that uh, the that space and single use devices um, is one way. Uh, that companies seem to be addressing it. Um, and our next question, uh, are there limitations to smaller um, or miniature robotic platforms? And what is the biggest barrier of adoption when competing with large robotic systems? Uh, Stuart? Well, <clears throat> you've seen my presentation, so I'm somewhat biased. I think there are um, almost no limitations um, in adopting the, the smaller, um, less expensive, easier to use um, robots <clears throat> compared to the big ones. And um, I really don't see um, a lot of barriers. We, as a company, um, have a mission to um, make our technology available to as many um, physicians as want well to use it as po as possible, and um, <clears throat> the, the, that's why the the, the miniaturisation and the business model go hand in hand. We're trying to overcome both of these major barriers, and you know we made a decision three years ago that we would not become an implant company, that we would not pursue the same business model as the big companies and that we would always be an open um, uh, implant or implant agnostic company. And <clears throat> I think that that approach means that our technology being easy to use and av available without restriction is appealing to the majority of the market, whereas the current large complex robots which have um, restrict your choice of implants um, is really for the innovators and early adopters, you know, that 15 to 20 percent of the market, um, not for the majority of the market. So um, I'm somewhat biased, though, Amanda, and maybe not the right person to for an objective answer to that question. But I, I thought that you might say as much, um, but... Uh, <laughs> But, but all, always good to always good to ask anyway. Um, okay, I think that we are running a little bit low on time. So for our final question, and there and there were quite a few uh, questions, um, unfortunately that we didn't get to. So once again, um, any questions that did not get answered during the the live stream here today, uh, the the speakers will have access to those to answer offline. Uh, so for the uh, final question. Uh, oh, that's not the one. Um, do you think that IoT and electronics will be irre irrelevant in the near future as AI and automation, uh, robotic surgical devices, continue to be innovated? And I suppose uh, this one could uh, easily be for both of you. I'll defer to Errol. I think he's better placed to answer that question. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, there's a lot of value to connectivity, uh, whether it's a device or instrument. There's a lot of data being generated, uh, whether it's a motor running, uh, sensors uh, logging, um, and uh, connectivity and upload of that data to the right uh, uh, data lake on the cloud is, uh, is critical. In the old days, we used to worry about security, but I think there's a there's a, a lot of good ways now to do that. And I think um, you know connectivity for me, every every device made, whether it's uh, what Stuart's making or a uh, or a scope, uh, getting that data and and collecting it is is powerful because that data will allow for service predictability. You might you might see that you're going to have some problems down the road. You can do a lot with that data. Uh, not just to, to support the current product, but to develop ideas on how to make things better in the future. So I, I kind of sidestepped your question, but I, but I think that there's a lot of value in 
IoT devices and connectivity uh, because it allows for us to be more predictive and analyze that data. And AI will play part in that, will play a role in that. And I would only well, add that uh, um, the benefits are uh, as Errol stated, but uh, and the opportunities are as Errol stated, but um, this remains one of the most challenging conversations in healthcare today about who owns what data and how is it all being protected. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work needs to be done uh, between the various stakeholders to arrive at a situation where the right data is available to the right stakeholder at the right time for the right purpose. Uh, complex, complex topic. Thank you both so much. That is all the time that we have for questions today, but we appreciate your time and expertise on today's topic. Um, thank you also again to our sponsors, Essential Medical and Life Sciences, and um, Think Surgical, as well as to everyone in the audience. We appreciate your participation and attention. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been able, able to uh, join us uh, for the live event today. Additionally, we hope you'll consider joining us in person June 4th through 6th in Charlotte, North Carolina for MD DNM South. Visit the resource widget for details. This webinar is copyright 2024 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Informa Markets. The individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, Stuart Simpson and Errol Ertick, I am Amanda Peterson. Thank you for your time and have a great day.